It's going to be a very informal um, uh, session, and uh, we have designated panelists, but I hope that everyone in the room will consider themselves effectively a panelist as we as we talk about this, because it's an issue of considerable uh, importance, and I think I better read what the issue specifically is, the topic of the panel. And uh, uh, the topic is moving beyond traditional academic scholarship, obstacles and ideas. And what I thought I might recommend that we do is maybe just go around the room initially, and for those of you who are who are in, in the academic world, maybe just share a challenge or two that you've encountered, and then and then once we've done that, then we'll talk about some of the ways that the problem might ultimately uh, might ultimately be addressed. And um, uh, each of you maybe can just introduce a little introduce yourself a little bit as to where you came from, and, and just give us a little bit of background information, and then we'll uh, sort of proceed uh, from that. And uh, you, would you be willing to start us off? Sure. Do we have to get up? Or no, 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 no. Let's, let's keep this casual. <laughs> I'm David Waters, and uh, I'm a professor at Purdue University, and uh, my area of interdisciplinary research and education is in cancer and aging and comparative medicine. And uh, I would, I mean, in, in looking at Brandon's uh, uh, great idea here of what we would discuss, I, I guess the two things that come to mind are are how do we in academia get renewal, number one, and number two, how do we achieve public influence from our research? We publish in peer-reviewed scientific journals, but but uh, can we do more to communicate our research to the public? Do you have any kind of example or, or anything, you know, an example of something that you, ch particular challenge that you found in those areas? Um, I, don't, I don't really think renewal is built into most academic situations. People talk about it, that it's essential for us to go into the classroom and transform students, but I don't think renewal is built into that sort of thing. And I think that the, uh, the communicating the public, I, I focused in on the words um, impact, research impact that Grandin talked about, and maybe we should try to define that or clarify that a little bit better. But, but I think one of the ways that we can have impact is if our research truly has important implications for the public, how do we make sure that the public gets access to that information in context, instead of leaving it to the media to somehow translate our research for us. So I think that's an important area for you to you have You have been, had some experience with the media translating your research. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we probably all have, we yeah. probably all have. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 could you relate your... Uh, why don't we just... Why don't we go around, around first and then we'll... Uh, then we'll um, uh, 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 this is a, a Matt Malarkey, one of, my, <laughs> one of the doctoral students in my department who I invited. Uh, what we're doing now, since you just managed to make it from my four, is we're just introducing ourselves and, and if you have any comments specifically about the topic, which is moving beyond academic scholarships, obstacles, and ideas, what we're focusing right now is some of the challenges we face. So Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? And then sure. So my name is uh, Matt Malarkey. Uh, as Grandin said, um, I am at the University of South Florida in the doctoral program. I'm in my fourth year. I've completed everything uh, to be a doctoral candidate uh, except defend my dissertation, which I hope to do between now and the end of the summer. So um, in terms of my background, prior to coming to USF, um, I ran uh, two different medical device companies, Fortune 1000 public companies in the US as a chief operating officer or president. Um, and then prior to that, I spent 11, 12 years of my life in automotive, uh, mainly with Michelin Tire around the world. And then prior to that, I was a young military officer, airborne ranger, um, having graduated from West Point. Pretty brief. 
So, so no. as a as a doctoral student, you know, what, what have you know what have your experiences been, and how does the research we're doing compare to the types of things that you expected, and in terms of things like impact, which I think is something we definitely worth talking about. Yeah, so I think Brandon and I are very uh, very much in concert when it comes to the opportunities for research to have an impact in the business community. In my particular case, I'm very excited about the fact that I do think we have an opportunity and a responsibility from an academic perspective to take a really good hard look at a lot of the existing theories and a lot of existing research and find out if it can't anticipate for business um, a, a little bit about the future. So we're in the information systems realm. My particular research is trying to help figure out if we can not help organizations anticipate um, how to behave socially in the world that they live in today, which is one that's consumed by online behaviors, as opposed to um, their historical offline social interaction. Uh, that's the entire focus of my research. Um, I'm convinced that when you look at the big gap that's out there, there's a lot of interpersonal interaction online that mirrors offline social behavior. There's some intra-company sort of online behavior that mirrors offline behavior. And there's almost no real significant, meaningful, measurable online interaction between organizations um, that would that comes close to the kind of offline behavior that they have ongoing for things like, in my particular area, study private equity. You know, the kind of offline social interaction that private equity performs through telephone calls and interpersonal meetings and relationship building and all of that almost has no counterpart online. And I believe it will. And I believe that when you look at the body of research that exists, it tells us it'll happen. And yet, one of the challenges is how do you publish in our domain, any of our you know, major journals, uh, about an artifact that doesn't exist? But you know it will. So, and, and then beyond that, I just um, enjoy the teaching aspect of what we do. I do believe we have a responsibility to share knowledge that way. And the work that, you know, Brandon has done in our business college on case discussion and the case discussion <coughs> format uh, has happened to be something I'm a huge proponent of. And in fact, every single company, small, medium sized company I know, um, I'm slowly but surely pulling them into more publishable cases. Right? <laughs> Matt is actually the individual who took over my undergraduate class. When, when I ran out of room in my schedule to, to teach it, which is fortuitous uh, as far as I can see. So uh, we're just going around and introducing ourselves and if you have had research, you know, challenges in, in that make you want to rethink research, feel free to mention them. You, would you introduce yourself, Philip? My name is Philip Zermagazaki from South Africa. I teach at the University of South Africa I have a PhD in applied statistics, and I do research in that area, applied statistics. So, you know, as a tool, statistics can be used in any discipline. Yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead, introduce. You want me to? Oh, of course, of course. Uh, my name is Gianta Chaudhary. Um, I don't work in an university. I work as a technology researcher uh, in TeamQuest Corporation, which is a company that uh, produces uh, software tools to measure the application performance and then predict and model uh, how long that system can uh, handle the performance of the application based on user demand who are using it. And then if you need more to buy different hardware, so more memories, so it can predict those stuff. And I have a PhD in applied mathematics and masters in computer engineering. Well, as someone who's working in the private sector, <coughs> field that uh, you know, is academic research meeting your needs, or how you know, if 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 
if you could have your choice of what research came out of universities, what might it look like? Mostly the academic research is waste. <laughs> Uh, I'll just give some examples that I have seen in math department and computer science department. Um, the, the eagerness is to get some paper published, get some paper, not a good paper. Uh, and then what people do is they have an equation, so, or like in computer science, you design a circuit, you design a memory, or a flip flop that goes into memory, and you try to, you know, alternate the design of the oscillator, like a hardware circuit, and you simulate and publish. Then next semester, you change one resistor capacitance, and then publish another paper, and show some 10 percent, or you know, and you actually design your experiments in a way to show that what you did is better. And, uh, but eventually, uh, in practical applications, um, hardly it is uh, of any value. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne? Hi, I'm Suzanne Lunsford. I'm from Wright State University, and I have my PhD from the University of Cincinnati, and so I'm an Ohio native, but I love the state of Florida. And um, what I want to say is that I, I work in chemical education, but I also am a professor, full professor in the chemistry departments where all my salary comes from, but I'm very interested in chemical education and how to make students learn because we know in the United States that our students are not the top students that are getting hired in industry, and so our concern at our university is how do we encourage the United States to continue to be the top in, in, in the country in terms of research because we know it's very competitive and we have people from overseas that we always have to hire and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's sad because in the United States, we don't have the American students wanting to learn math and science and how do we engage them into that. And also, I'm sure in the business field, that can be dramatic too because we want them to be problem-based learners and critical thinking skills, as Joanne has emphasized this morning. That is so valuable and that's the problem is that at the university, sometimes we are actually, uh, as professors, it's hard sometimes to do critical thinking skills when you have 200 to a lecture hall and it takes a lot of time, but it's worthwhile because that is our future. So that's where my, my value goes, and that's why I really value Brandon Gill's book on case studies, because I feel that case studies are really gonna be valuable too for my students, and so that during my sabbatical next year, thanks to Brandon, I, I plan on going through and, and developing case studies to encourage our students into science and math, and how can we make them problem solve and critical think and, and resolve problems that are real world analysis with analytical chemistry. Well, it doesn't just stop here and say, okay, well, now we've got a solution, we can all go home. No, but we I, I think, but, I, but, I, I was but I'm not, but I'm not sure that, <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm, I'm quite ready to make that concession. Why don't we keep going around? Thank I'm you. I'm just saying, case studies are valuable. Oh, well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that <laughs> vote of support. <laughs> you don't, you don't see it that much in my department, but I, but I do appreciate it. Uh, uh, Renan, you would introduce yourself? Cybersecurity, so it's uh, very specific. Uh, so I'm here to interesting to listen to this session, to this plenary. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, now, do you uh, do much reading of the academic research in cybersecurity? I mean, is if you know from someone in your perspective as a junior researcher, is the research meeting your needs or or would you like to see different types of research coming out you mean uh, what is, uh, well in other words the universities are producing a lot of research now in the cyber security area are you finding that to be useful in in in, in what you're trying to accomplish or do you wish the research were different or i'm just trying to get some points of comparison here uh, honestly honestly i see that it's, uh, for me it's Kind of useless. Okay. Um, maybe I didn't. Uh, I can find the applicate of this knowledge. I feel uh, sometimes I feel my research is useless. Okay. Well, well thank you. <laughs> we're we're getting a uh, we're starting to get a theme here. <laughs> uh, would you introduce yourself? Thank you. Hi, my name is Carlos Aguilera. I come from Mexico. Um, I work as a teacher. Uh, mathematical like topics. 
are um, mathematical application and computer science and basically, basically uh, numerical analysis. I'm more technical than, uh, than computer science. Okay, and then do you, you know, has, is the academic research that, that, that comes out of computer science, I guess, and in the medical area, has that proven useful to you, or is that not something that you need to use on a regular basis? Well, for example, in, in your job, does it is it helpful to you to read uh, uh, the academic publications that ah, come yes. out in the computer science area? Or yes, yes, it's important to read about uh, technical papers and uh, academic reports. Um, we need to read and read. And, and is is the stuff you're reading mainly coming out of universities, or is it coming out of uh, industry, uh, you know, organ no, from the university. Mainly from universities. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Please go well, ahead. Well, I'm Juan Sadri. Um, I guess in terms of research challenges, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an associate professor of international relations at the uh, Department of Political Science at the University of Central Florida. Um, I, I would see uh, my challenge in three different ways. One part of it, I kind of uh, learned how to handle it. And that was finding the right, right collaborator. As you noticed in a couple of the sessions we've been together, you know, I found a nice collaborator and we've been working together for a number of years. So that part of it I can handle. The second part of it, uh, which is a little bit more, uh, you know, significant challenge is, uh, you, know, the, there's a, you know, the grants are getting harder and harder to come by. And grants for me are important. I mean, I'm not a physicist or, you know, professor of computer science that I would buy $10,000 or $10,000, that's cheap, I guess. Million dollar, you know, lab or something. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, if somebody gives me 5,000, 4,000, as long as I can buy my ticket to go to somewhere where I'm supposed to conduct, you know, uh, field research, I'm happy. But even those things are becoming harder and harder to come by right now. That's one. And the last but not least challenge, which I'm shying away from that one, was, you know, the habit that I got when, when I was a grad student. Uh, for example, I was, you know, I study a lot of the, you know, revolutionary states and movements and everything. So sometimes I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> like when, when I was a grad student, I almost got killed in Tajikistan because a bunch of Russian soldiers, they didn't want to see any Americans, especially some, you know, with, you know, what do you call it, computers and big, you know, cameras and everything out there. So sometimes I put myself in that <laughs> situation, but, you know, that, you know, that has reduced significantly. I, I, and I still think you don't take my collaborator there. Yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. I Because I know that you're interested yeah. in collaborating, yeah. you know. So I thought, no, don't worry. I Apparently, you have really put the action, action in action research. Yeah, I research. Really like yeah. Action. <laughs> in my department, they call me double O H. <laughs> <laughs> communication and I would certainly agree with Human that one of the challenges that we face because we do have a group at UCF that we've developed where we work with a couple of faculty members in communication doing interdisciplinary research and we may be expanding that to someone in education and so we're really challenged to try to find grants so a lot of what we do is not it's supported in theory by our university but not in practice so we're trying to find ways to have funding so that we can do some of these things and not have to do it on top of all the other things we're doing, that we can get a little assistance. And so that's one challenge. I think the other challenge that we've experienced is because we're doing a lot of interdisciplinary work, sometimes it's challenging to find places to publish that or to find places to publish that that are going to be recognized and count for something within our own field. So that's been really challenging. The book we did together, we really had a hard time finding a publisher only because everybody said, well, it's sort of in this, but it's sort of in that, and we don't really know where to categorize it, so we don't want it. So, so some of the things, you know, that, that you mentioned are, you know, the challenges of, you know, of interdisciplinary research, you know, finding outlets that we can use, you know, the challenges of, of finding grants, uh, the... Uh, the challenges of, of producing research that appears useful, particularly to those in practice. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm listing these in my head. So once we go around the whole circle, we can we can maybe talk about some of these things more specifically. Yeah, uh, Jeffrey, you want to go ahead? Sure. 
so my name is Jeff Dunn. <coughs> I'm a researcher at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. The, my background has been pretty diverse uh, from mechanical engineering through physics, uh, information science, some cybersecurity, uh, sensors, data fusion. I've sort of been going around in a variety of different areas. Um, when, I, when I was looking at the, at the topic, looking beyond traditional academic scholarship, and my, uh, I, have, I have some thoughts on this, my challenge is to say it in one minute or less, so I'll do my best. Um, actually, probably a good story to frame this is some 15 years ago, I was talking to a kid in high school who was developing a new technology for detecting earthquakes. And he, he had asked me for my advice on how to go about doing this. And I said, well, you know, you can try to connect with the university and do sort of thing. And he made it happen on his own. Uh, brilliant kid. And I, I couldn't help but think at that time, and I'm thinking especially now, that there are a ton of other people out there with wonderful ideas, kids, people who are older or what have you, but not maybe that brilliant, that who, with assistance from the university, where people, that kind of resource, would have a tremendous impact on the way things go. And the university has traditionally had reasonably well-defined barriers. And I say it that way, I mean, interfaces you could call it, but in some ways they are barriers. For most people, it starts at the age of 18 and ends at the age of 22. Uh, for some people, it doesn't, right? And we are definitely breaking it down in certain areas, the distinction between academia and industry, we're getting more cross-pollination and so forth. But when you think about uh, what David had said earlier about writing books and reaching out to the public, right, the interface between academia and the public is, is actually not um, breaking down terribly much. And the public has a lot to benefit from what academia has to offer and vice versa, I think. And so finding ways to start to make that interface more effective, where somebody doesn't necessarily have to become a university professor in order to pursue something or to use the resources, the intellectual resources that a university has, is an area that I think is really right. And you know, at every instant in history, it behooves somebody to ask, how should we be reinventing ourselves today? If we had to establish what academia should look like and we didn't already exist, what do we want it to look like, what it looks like right now? Right? And I don't know that we would. Um, there are pieces, there's a lot of value there, and there are some pieces that are a little more broken <laughs> than maybe we would like. Um, so this is, like I said, my attempt to capture what is this much thought <laughs> into this much time. And I know I haven't talked about 90% about of the, the aspects of this effectively, but at least it gets the idea out there. And you know, maybe we'll spark further discussion. No, that, no. thank you. Uh, that's very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm so sorry because I don't speak English very well, but, but okay. My name is Gloria Marciales. I am a teacher, I am professor at Portuguese University of Javier in Bogota, Colombia. And um, my research area is in the uh, uh, digital natives and uh, information competencies. Uh, I am involved in a um, doctoral program related to uh, social sciences. And um, um, I am here because it, uh, it is an interdisciplinary program, and we have all the problems that anybody could have when we have teachers who are uh, in disciplinary departments and they are trying to make interdisciplinary mm -hmm. research. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you're very eloquent. I uh, you've got nothing to apologize for. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> okay, and Jean. I'm Jean Late and I'm from uh, England and I teach at um, Leeds Metropolitan University in the north of England and my discipline is education. Um, I'm involved in initial teacher education and what our, our issues are, I suppose, are that we have very strategic learners and a little bit what um, the Suzanne was saying, we want to get our students to be independent learners, critical thinkers, what you were saying. Um, we've also, in the last few years, um, had this um, in this imposition of um, the students have to pay nine thousand pounds, eighty pounds a year, and they become consumers. 
And so they are looking towards employability. Um, they're strategic learners because they have been able to pass tests all the time. They're there, they want me to tell them how to get the next test passed in order to become teachers. I, my colleagues and I are trying to um, introduce lateral thinking, creativity, dare I say it, um, because we, we want to pass these skills on that have been lost in their education so that they can educate future generations to be creative, um, all, all those things that are, that are lacking. The problems that we've got to do with research is that we are very short staffed. We haven't got an awful lot of money going along, even though the, the students are bringing in a lot of money. We're still um, short of staff, which means that research is all squeezed. The, the teaching, you know, the teaching and learning that's going on, we're expected to, to put in, you know, the end degree. And I, I see people nodding their heads around the table here. But it's the, the research is always, it's like, it, like my research, it's my responsibility. I, I do that evenings and weekends, you know, because that's, you know, that's how it, it's valued. Um, and, and so what we try and do, those of us who are pushing towards research, to say, look, if we can, if we can find out more, we will be better people, we will, be, um, we will have more depth to be able to uh, model to the students, this is what we want you to do, so that when they're doing their um, dissertations and sort of thing, you know, we can say, well, this is what we do, you know, and to have doctorates, to have professors, it, it's something that would be good, but it's, it's very, it's very it was difficult for me to come here because of the time, because of the money. So, you know, it's a miracle I'm here, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's just a snapshot of the difficulties we have. Okay, thank you again. So that's, that's similar to the, what they mentioned, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, the, the challenge of, yes. of finding resources yes. to do the research. Yes. Uh, for brief. Yes, uh, I am Fabrice Moulin, I come from Paris, France. And so I have to do, I apologize, because I don't speak French at all. But, um, uh, I am uh, associate professor of the University of Paris East, and uh, uh, the research my this um, area uh, is about um, distributed application on numerical analysis. And uh, um, I wanted to, what I wanted to say is that uh, I supervise the PhD students, and uh, at, during the first year, I guess that uh, their pro first problem is. Uh, when they read um, academic publications, for instance, uh, they consider that the value of the publications is very close to the rank of the conference. And, uh, they do not have uh, uh, some um, enough background to, to have their own evaluation. And sometimes uh, the result is uh, that they read a lot of, uh, a lot of documents and uh, they are not uh, able to, to compare or to, to order or to extract what is the most important result. I think you raise a very interesting point, which I want to talk about one point, which is how to sort of establish the objective value of the research. Because what you're describing is not just a problem with your introductory doctoral students. If you actually look at the peer review process at our top journals, such as in, in, in business, one of the top journals, the Ministry of Science Quarterly, they did a study of the uh, correlation between reviewers for the articles. And this is one of our top journals, yeah. and the correlation was 0.2. You know, you could practically get 0.2 with randomness. Uh, and, you know, basically, they did a probabilistic study of what this actually meant. And, it turns out there's a huge amount of arbitrariness in the in the uh, selection of articles. So it's not just a problem for the doctoral students. Everybody's looking for cues as to what the value of the research is. Very interesting. Uh, Lena, go ahead. I'm uh, at the Air Force Research Lab and at Harvard University. And I'd say that 40 years ago, I was probably reading everything in my domains. <coughs> which are several, uh, like um, modeling of the mind mathematically, there are uh, deriving algorithms for solving engineering problems from uh, these models, and, 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 and more. And within this area, I do several disciplines and change my areas several years. 
and uh, this interdisciplinary interests are uh, certainly not supported by structures of today academic uh, institutions and kind of values and environment. Uh, uh, very difficult to publish. Well, I shouldn't complain, I published enough. But uh, I would publish more uh, if uh, uh, the overall kind of structure will support interdisciplinary publications. And when you change field from uh, you know, every, every several years, uh, uh, reviewers and journals don't know what you're writing about. Uh, certainly, they don't think that they're stupid, they think you're stupid. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, of, yeah, in terms of reading academic publications, I know who are reviewers in field, and I will read them today. There are too many publications which are very narrow, and uh, not to say that they're bad quality, but just uh, the best one, even still, are just very, very narrow. As somebody just commented, you know, just add one more, you know, letter and equation, improve by 0.2% performance of the previous algorithm. And, and that's considered serious research. So, oh, well, when there are too many researchers, what? <laughs> OK, <laughs> so that, that's another you know, interesting <coughs> question. You know, we're, in a sense, facing information overload. How many of us here feel that uh, there are probably too many papers in our respective fields to really get a grip on all of them. Any, any, any takers on that? I mean, good, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot of hands here. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it can be very uh, challenging. And it's particularly challenging if you put this on top of what Fabrice said and talk about the challenge of assessing what the value of papers are. How do you, how do you select the ones, you know, that are most valuable? And that, you know, that, so that raises some interesting questions. Najib, I'll skip over you for the moment. But then I'll, I'll move, I'll move to Joanne. <laughs> I'm the other quiet person in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I come at it from a slightly different point of view. My background is uh, chemistry and education, except I teach none of the above. I teach engineering. And you say, why? That's a long sermon. Um, as far as working with across domains, uh, my partner, who is not able to make it here, is in the School of Business, whereas I am in education. So all of my research actually is a combination of schools of business and schools of uh, education, which has led us to a dual quandary that no one accepts anything. <laughs> because after all, the School of Business, well, it came from education, and the education, no, it only applies to business. So everyone rejects it unanimously, in spite of the fact that we developed the only course which has been demonstrated to actually teach people how to think critically. 80 years of research, the first one that can demonstrate that it works. And the problem is that at that point that nobody wants it. So as you mentioned earlier, um, business people are screaming that the people graduating from schools of business have no idea how to work. They can't solve problems, they can't make decisions, and they can't think creatively, amongst other things. <laughs> so the very course that would be helpful to them is the very course which is being denied. Uh, we also discussed this morning that um, educators, people who are being trained to teach in schools, are not trained in how to teach their students how to think, because they themselves don't know how to think. So I look at this and say, there's a fundamental problem of hubris going on, which I don't know how to attack. Everyone is sure, and again, we, we have lots and lots and lots of, of evidence on this from Dunning et al., that if you are not an expert in a particular field, you are sure that it's easy and you can do it easily. And of course, we find that that's not the case. But then I will go to a school and say, well, let us talk about uh, how we could implement critical thinking in, in your department. They say, oh, no, 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 we've got that. It, it's no problem here. I had one person berate me because he said, well, the AACSB accreditation, it, it requires that. So we have it in all of our classes, except their students are also not being hired because they can't think their way out of an open room. And so 
I look at the whole thing and say, we've got to break down some of these silos. We have to admit that uh, outside of our own areas of expertise, we're dumb as a sack of hammers. And that when someone else comes to us and says, this is my area of expertise, you go, cool. Except I don't see that, especially in universities, where everyone walks around as though their fecal matter has no odor. <laughs> well, in all, in all fairness, so there are a lot of fields where the ex experts are as dumb as a load of hammers as well, to phrase it that way. Yep. Uh, so, uh, uh, he joined us. Would you uh, care to if you can introduce that slide? Thank you. My family is I work as CEO in our institute Before I worked in National Catholic University. More than 30 years. На факультете механика математика моделирования. My hero is mathematical modeling. И исследование динамики экономических, физических и других систем. And dynamic of Economical and uh, technical, technical systems. Okay. Uh, and, uh, which describes is uh, differential equations. Uh, our institute has uh, different. Разпознавание образов, different uh, areas which are recognition, cyber security, expert systems, method optimization, математическое моделирование, и другие. Ну, я хочу сказать, когда я пять лет назад пришел, численность по сравнению uh, I want to say that five years ago it was uh, not a lot of uh, people worked in uh, science research. Now and uh, uh, increasing financial like in uh, eleven times. Ну, я приехал сюда э, посмотреть, э, чем занимаются мои, мои, мои молодые коллеги в этой области. И установить контакт с вами в этой области. А, ну, еще хочу сказать, что э, вот, один из моих учеников э, здесь, он сломал сайт Нью-Йорка в Лондоне. Поэтому он пригласил его и адвоката и сказал, что хорошие деньги, да? Но на самом деле он их обманул. Адвоката посадил в тюрьму на два года, а Зелья его на четыре года. So the, the mayor uh, invites them and his lawyer to uh, give them money to, to can, can be played, but he, he uh, said that it, uh, it will help them to make a new website, but he didn't that. He uh, set them in prison. <laughs> А? Ну, э, я э, приглашаю вас к сотрудничеству. У нас вот подготовка идет на второй PSD. И платят хорошие деньги. Also we can invite, uh, like, uh, и э, два научных руководителя. Один наш и э, другой из дальнего. 
Get money. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, actually, this raises another issue with respect to research, uh, the one that has been raised actually by, by a couple of people, uh, and that is that right now, you know, what happens to the researcher who does not publish in English? Uh, and what happens to the researchers, you know, who, who are in uh, a country where the na prevailing language is not English? Uh, uh, in China, for example, you have a lot of research that's being published in Chinese and it operates in an almost entirely different research stream from uh, the one that we have uh, uh, you know, in English language research. And even among English language research, there are frequently complaints that are voiced about uh, the fact that US researchers end up dominating a lot of the top ranked journals, perhaps mainly because they're US researchers. So, you know, is that fair? Are we actually getting the best possible mix? Uh, Najib, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then I, I'd like to move on to some other questions. Uh, I'm Najib Kalaos, and uh, 45 years ago, I was an electrical engineer. Then uh, after my PhD, uh, uh, what I learned from my PhD is that I, the Socratic dictum, I know that I don't know anything. And that was my PhD left me. So I took five years of formal philosophy full time to see if I can know anything. And I found out that I still know nothing. So, and I still feel there is no way to know anything unless you relate action with thinking. So this is why all what we can call research, that depends on who's defining research, all what I did in my life is action research. Action learning, which by the way is research also, and action design, which is the actual research for engineering, because I am here. I cannot see the benefit of any kind of research that is not related cybernetically with action. I mean, flowing the information from research to practice, but also from practice so now I'm 70 years old. I had to leave my country 10 years ago, bring my family here. And really the thing that I most miss, that I miss most, mostly, is teaching. I always dream that I will die teaching. My dream comes not true. Uh, so what I got left in life, what I'm going to try to do my best is to help those people that can achieve what I felt in my life, which I can synthesize in a word, integration, to integrate thinking with action, to integrate uh, Disciplines to interdisciplinary the communication, interdisciplinary education and research, and through relating the university with the industry. This is the only thing that I contributed in my life that the, the actual regime in Venezuela did not destroy it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Now, at this point, what I'd like to do is, you know, we have multiple uh, 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 chairs designated for this discussion. And what I would suggest is if any one of these chairs wants to take over the facilitation for a while, I would be delighted to, to move down. And if, 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 no, if we don't get any volunteers, then what I would suggest is there are two things that sort of jumped up at me that we might want to talk about now in a sort of a conversational way. 
One was uh, what Dr. Waters mentioned, which is the question of what is impact? Because I think that's, you know, one of the challenges we often have is we use these terms, we don't even necessarily know what other people mean when they say that. And if we can, if we can come to any uh, consensus or uh, agreement to diverge on what impact is, then we might ask the really hard question, which is what is research? And I'm sure we won't come to a consensus on that. That's been one of the big challenges. But if anyone else would <laughs> would care to lead the discussion. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> All right. I don't, sure, want to, I, I, I don't want to chair it, but I want to. I was just listening very carefully yeah. to what everybody is talking about. It seems like we can categorize everything we are talking about into like three, you know, three basic areas. Right. One area of it is obviously our research. The other one is our teaching. But I think, in a kind of indirectly, from what I heard from different people, it seems like they are also concerned about promotion. Is that right? And uh, you know, I mean, uh, Mother and I, we, we did a number of these presentations and everything, but we didn't do as much publication, you know, when we were, uh, you know, in our you know, assistant professor level, because, you know, the universities, they all give lip service that, oh yes, this is a great area, publish, 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 but the bottom line is, okay, what's the value of this journal, or what's the value of this? And yeah. earlier when we were talking, and you were talking about your journal, you said that this is one of those journals which actually caters into interdisciplinary. Well, a few years ago, you could hardly find anything like that. And one of the challenges right now with a lot of universities is that they say one thing, but they do something different. So it's very hard to you know, find you know, assistant professors and you know, younger, junior people that are willing to do it because they're structured to think. Mainstream journals, mainstream journals, that's where everybody gets the brownie points, is that right? Good. So that's one of the challenges. Okay. Well, that's, you know, that, and that is one you know, dimension of impact, uh, which I think is, in a practical sense, for people in terms of promotion and tenure, the question of where you publish is a, a huge one. Yeah, go ahead. I think Adnan joined, then you didn't ask him. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did, yeah, well, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't it's see. Okay. Did you want to <laughs> introduce yourself? And we'll oh, 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 I'm not sad. I'm. Uh, I'm uh, an associate professor and the chair of the electrical and computer engineering department uh, in the American University in Dubai. Uh, okay. Is this what? Uh, well, we're just saying people are talking about uh, you know any issues that they've had with research. You know, uh, the topic of this thing is what you know. You know, how can we transform research and sort of what are the challenges or what are the obstacles and the opportunities that we might have from that? Yeah, I might have some to add later on, but. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and thank you for letting me know. I thought that's a trouble losing track of who's here. So I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a, a very reasonable uh, question. Because it seems like there have been a lot of issues raised that relate to that specific question that we talked about. I mean, the question of too many journals uh, and too many articles to keep track of. Okay, how do you, how do we handle that? But at the meantime, junior faculty need to get promoted, and to get promoted, they need to publish articles in certain uh, locations. How do we deal with that? Uh, the question of lip service. Uh, I mean, this is. Every institution that I have seen, if you look at their mission statement, includes the words, you know, global or international and interdisciplinary. That has become the absolute theme. What is, <laughs> but, but, but is that what really matters? Did I see him? Well, you mentioned junior, uh, like assistant professors, but I think the, the matter even it, it persists at a department head level because they want to be dean. And so then, as a result, so they want to get more papers published, so then the junior faculty that has to align with him, if they don't go to his area, then mm -hmm. he's politically going to work against him that don't, they don't remain in the department and then kick them out. Oh, okay, I think that's a good point. And actually, I mean, one, I'd, I'd be interested just to get a sense of this, uh, because my sense may be somewhat different from someone else's, I'm interested in hearing what everyone says, is is the problem principally one of administrations not valuing this thing, or is it the faculty themselves that are the issue with Suzanne? I think the administration doesn't value it, and I totally agree that sometimes what happens, 
and I seen it in my department and so we had a chair and he was chair and they would have where he was get an assistant professor he would hire and then they would try to tailor on to what they were doing to help them get publications. I totally agree with you. And then what would happen is what's called ghost authorship. So we got a new chair, and so she could look important. She put his name on the paper, but he was never involved in the process right. because I knew the whole thing. And, and he hadn't even ran any XRF data or anything. And so the, she just wrote that the preliminary MIT possibly would do this and put his name on the paper just to get brownie points. And right. to me, that's just really cheating. And then eventually the department head becomes dean and his whole cronies become department head, graduate that's coordinator, right. and that's right. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I would add another thing. Power struggle. Yeah. How you can handle that situation. Power struggle. Yeah, well, because they, a lot of times they view it as a zero-sum game. You know, resources get shifted from one to another. What's interesting as we have this conversation is nobody's actually mentioning the quality or the potential impact of the research. We're all talking about the <clears throat> political aspects of it, the social aspects of it. Is, is this the way to create the best research? Uh, you know, essentially to have it enforced by a social system. Uh, and and I, I, I mean, I, my own sense, and this, my institution might be different, but, but I believe that we can, you know, it's easy to blame the administration, because if you're a faculty member and you blame the administration, then it's not your fault. But a lot of what I see is self-inflicted wounds, uh, where, the faculty member values certain things, and the deans say, okay, if that's what you value, then that's, you know, that's what you'll be measured on. So if, if you as a faculty say, okay, we're only going to value publications in these top three uh, uh, journals, the dean will be happy to go along with that, and it might not, the dean might even have a broader view, but it's very hard to get faculty to do things they don't want to do. Go ahead, please. I think to some extent, we may be over homogenizing the situation yep. um, because all universities, colleges, institutions of higher education are not the same in structure or in goals yep. or what have you. And so we're we're talking about them as if they are here, but they're really not. And you know, as much as the, and and they're not just subject to their own internal drivers of you know. Yes, of course, the politics associated with this are one yep. thing. But we were having a conversation at lunch about, you know, there's a conflict in, in what the role of these universities are in society, in, in existence for that matter. And the solutions for what they are are going to look different if you're talking about the small liberal arts college populated with professors who went there to educate young people, as opposed to institutions that are there primarily as research houses. Um, and, and probably, it's right that the solution is not the same for them. Um, and so I think we'll, we will run into trouble if we try to look at it. I, I think that's an extremely good point. And, I, and, and, and you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the individuals here are coming out of research university communities. And that's, you know, it, is a, it may be a potentially different thing in some of these other institutions, though one of the things forces seems to be a lot of them are moving more towards this research model. Please if go I ahead. may add to actually what uh, you know, Jeff is yeah. uh, saying, I agree with him. Different institutions, they have different, you know, cultures. You know, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, um, and I noticed that, for example, when I was on the campus of uh, Rollins College, you know, visiting one of my, uh, you know, colleagues over there, and this is all over the campus. They have put these plaques, like the plaques that you know you put if you have a yard sale yeah. or you know you like you know s some event going on. And it was referring to one of the professors who got Fulbright. And I like I said, what a big deal! I've already have got three Fulbrights, but my <laughs> university doesn't value that because with Fulbright you come up with like thirty thousand, forty thousand. You know you want to go during usually summertime, so it's not your full salary. Even with everything else, thirty, forty thousand, and they are interested in terms of going for, you know, for promotion from associate to full, they are interested in million dollar, you know, grants and things like that. That majority of the grant is usually, you know, in our department, no, uh, in, you know, thing intended, you know, it's all intended, but a lot of, uh, you know, they put us with, you know, political science, they put us with the College of Sciences, so we are competing with biologists and physicists and chemists that they buy these million dollar, you know, labs or something like that. I, 
I don't have a million dollar lab. Yeah. A million dollar lab would not be probably even my retirement for the entire 30, yeah. 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it was just like, you know, I mean, they have very, very, very different standards in terms of evaluating. But, you know, getting a Fulbright, those of you who have had it, you know, it's not easy. It's very, very competitive. It goes through like three stages. You know, you have to do this, you have to do that. So for them, at least for our institution, the bottom line is the dollar amount of the grant, you know, and which is very difficult. And in terms of the journal, it's the same thing too. You know, uh, we are considering, we are both associate, you know, we are hoping one day we will be full professor. You know, but it seems like the rules of the game has changed too. Now they are emphasizing basically the mainstream, you know, journals as opposed to these interdisciplinary ones. So if we are doing it, like you, we are basically doing it on our own time for those particular, because we are passionate about it, not because we are being encouraged and getting any brownie points for it. Well, uh, go ahead. There are two things I want to mention. One is, we are mentioning mostly the bad things, but one good thing I'll mention that the product that we have, the modeling part, it was mainly based on two research papers published in 1970. So that, that much time it takes to find a good research paper and implement it in product, and probably we have made um, several hundred do million dollars out of that one or two papers, one written by Professor Chandy in University of Texas at Austin, and then uh, Jeff Buzan from Harvard University. I, maybe you know him. Uh, Bill Gates was his student at some point. Uh, and then the another example, I'm just saying examples. Yeah, yeah. I'm not giving any like continuous work that, yeah. that truth with the capital T. Uh, I was in a conference and there was this uh, big professor uh, from MIT, uh, I don't want to mention his name, but his, he was in psychology and seems like he has a lot of money, maybe several million dollar labs, so he was doing an experiment with this sociometric badge. Uh, the idea was that a traditional brainstorming type of meeting doesn't really produce results, it's a spontaneous discussions over lunch or dinner or a break uh, produces the real uh, you know, things that eventually you can go and then implement it. So they had these badges that will monitor uh, tonal changes in your voice, uh, facial changes as you speak, your uh, dilation of pupils and all this stuff. And so, uh, and then here showing some results that, you know, comparing with people having sociometric badges and, you know, projects where people actually had the sociometric badges and projects where they did not have, and then I asked him, uh, did he do any study? What is the bias factor because of people's awareness that they have these badges? Because I know if a cop car is standing in the road, and I'm not going to behave the, my natural way that I drive. Uh, and so he said, oh yeah, we know we have uh, tested it, and people just forget after a while that they have these badges. And I, then I asked again, do you have any measured study? And they said, yeah, yeah, I know we have been doing it for 15 years and we know what we are doing and so. Do the side that, that uh, I would like uh, to go to the other part uh, also of scholarship, yeah. uh, not just the research. Uh, and if we can do that, I really would like, you know, to ask uh, Dr. Waters about uh, relating his uh, uh, plenarization, the content of his plenarization, to the aspect of, you know, this aspect of scholarship. Mm -hmm. I, I, feel, I feel, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel it's 